allow me to welcome you uh, on behalf of GIMO and the organizing committee of our conference at the fifth anniversary uh, conference, uh, The uh, Magic of Innovation. Today we are meeting in the uh, online format uh, to which I think many of you have got used uh, over the past year. My name is um, Kiliana Borisovna Morozova, uh, and I'm moderating this workshop at Daria Igorevna Terminasova is assisting me. Uh, the simultaneous interpretation is available. Uh, in order to have access to it, you must press the button uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we would like you uh, not to speak too fast in order to ensure the possibility for everyone uh, to be able to listen to all the presentations uh, we have foreign participants to. Uh, we are going to speak about uh, the dialogue of culture, and we have a baker's dozen of speakers, so to speak, a lucky number, and, uh, and uh, we have 10 minutes uh, for every presentation, and not more than five minutes for questions. The geography is very interesting. Traditionally, uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg are uh, represented, and also participants from Ivanova, Bashkiria, and Spain. And we shall be discussing issues of intercultural communication. And the first uh, presentations will be uh, dealing with how intercultural communications are uh, molded. And then we shall uh, come down to discussing to the uh, to discussing the problems that we in our students encounter. Once again, allow me to remind you of the time limits: ten minutes per presentation and five minutes for uh, Q and A uh, session. Uh, we'll be reminding you if you are not within the limits. And allow me to remind you that if you don't have a chance to ask the question online. You can always use the chat for this purpose. Now, let us start. The first speaker today is, uh, according to the schedule, Yekaterina Mikhailovna Grigoyeva, but so far I don't see her. So far, uh, Yekaterina Mikhailovna has not joined us. The next speaker is Valieva Fatima Ivanovna. So far, she is not present. Uh, the third speaker is Vasilisa Vitalievna Datsuk, uh, who represents uh, the Pushkin uh, State University in Leningrad. The, sorry, the Leningrad State University, named after Pushkin. Uh, could you please switch on the mic, the speaker? Um, well, good morning, colleagues. Uh, can I share my presentation with you? I would like to switch on the slides. Uh, can you see it? Yes, good. You can make it full screen uh, in order to uh, eliminate the upper fringe. Uh, could you press S5? Yes, that's it, wonderful. Yes, and everything is moving the way it should. Okay, uh, colleagues, the name of my presentation is The Role of the Intercultural Linguistic Component in the Formation of Intercultural and Discourse Competence Among University Students When Teaching Business English Discourse Within the Framework of the Theory and Practice of Intercultural Communication. The skills of intercultural communication are very important and I don't think uh, it is necessary to stress how important it is in um, the situation when the world is getting more and more globalized. Uh, I would like to stress the following aspect. In today's world, considerable changes are taking place uh, in different fields, including the language itself. And what is interesting is the fact that the English language is also changing, and at present, we uh, already uh, see that many researchers, Edmund Kirkpatrick and others, 
uh, have identified the emergence of the regional versions of the English language. We can speak about the Chinese regional version of the English language, the Korean one, uh, and the Indian one. Why is it important? Because uh, many people belonging to different cultures, different cultural communities are working with the same business uh, environment. Uh, and the situation in the cultural environment of the, uh, of the transnational corporations and smaller companies uh, well shows that uh, they are all interacting within this business uh, space. And of course, such uh, collectives uh, come across many uh, intercultural communication problems. And uh, of course, in most cases, the English language is the language of communication uh, in such corporations, but regional uh, versions of the uh, English language are becoming ever more important. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that there are a number of tasks that have to be dealt with uh, as companies uh, continue functioning. And uh, in order to communicate successfully, it, it, it is necessary to meet the pragmatic goals. The expert should be able to identify the goal of the intercultural communication, be it signing a contract, uh, taking a decision or something else. It is uh, necessary to identify correctly the uh, prospect, the probability of achieving this goal. And of course, it is necessary to choose the most optimal uh, mode of communication. Uh, it is important to motivate, uh, motivate the counterpart. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the um, speaking uh, skills are very important here. So a need arises uh, to work out uh, a certain structure of the interpersonal, uh, intercultural communication. Uh, uh, because many factors come into play, not only the linguistic ones. And now we understand the word discourse as the situation of communication, so very broadly. And accordingly, we have worked out the structure of intercultural discursive competence, and it contains two components, the discursive strategic and the intercultural uh, linguistic component. The first one compo uh, comprises uh, the knowledge, uh, the skills, uh, which combine verbal and non-verbal uh, means within the framework of communicative strategies. And the second one, uh, uh, combines the knowledge skills, uh, which are also a combination of linguistic means, which ensure um, appropriate business communication, taking into account the particular features, the specific features of the cultures of different regions. China is very important, the Chinese element is very important, and uh, the Chinese, the regional Chinese version of the uh, English language uh, is becoming uh, very important and a number of aspects should be taken into account, uh, especially the strategic ones. The Chinese culture, uh, well, uh, leaves a certain in imprint on the um, structure of the talks, on the mode of the talks. Uh, the counterparts usually speak uh, good uh, English, good business uh, English, but nevertheless, there are a number of circumstances. Uh, we conducted our research on the basis of texts uh, from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University with uh, the uh, text of technical character and also the material of some Chinese companies working in St. Petersburg. So the conceptual uh, uh, cluster is divided into the verbal and the nonverbal aspect and the operational block is also divided into the verbal and nonverbal aspect. And in our research, we speak about the uh, linguos, uh, intercultural in a linguistic component that's one of the most important ones. And uh, I 
uh, cannot speak uh, simultaneously about both uh, components. So we speak mostly about the intercultural um, linguistic concept component. Uh, and it presupposes that the participants should have certain uh, language skills of conducting negotiations, of communicating with the with one's counterparts, uh, taking into account the culture of uh, the people coming from this region of Asia. So, uh, so uh, I have presented this structure to you, which contains several uh, aspects, several facets. The verbal aspect of the conceptual block uh, means that uh, it is necessary to uh, have the knowledge of the linguistic uh, specific features of the regional version of the English language, uh, the um, speech etiquette, the uh, business uh, communication etiquette in the situation of a dialogue, uh, taking into account the characteristics of communicative uh, behavior of the people in this region. And if we speak, for example, about uh, representatives from Japan, they use the modal verbs more than anywhere. Uh, the verbs should and um, uh, it is desirable are used uh, more than anywhere. Uh, the, there are certain specific uh, particularities in how they use uh, the present tense form instead of the past sometimes. Uh, the people representing the Chinese companies very often use uh, simple sentences while the uh, native English speakers usually use uh, compound and complex sentences more. And uh, what can we deduce from it? Probably for the Chinese people, for the uh, Chinese society, uh, the logical links uh, are not as important as uh, they are uh, for the uh, people with a European cultural background. Uh, for the nonverbal aspect of the conceptual block, it's very important to know the index of the distance of uh, authority or power, which is characteristic of the communities of these regions, uh, the uh, knowledge of the uh, particular features of the process of decision making, um, uh, the importance of the feelings and uh, being very um, careful in not offending the feelings of uh, the counterpart. If we speak about the nonverbal aspect of the operational block, it's very important to uh, take into account uh, a, a, a number, an array of skills. Uh, we should be able to take into account the auxiliary means of communication, uh, which perform the function of uh, regulation and expression. We have to take into account the uh, tactile and kinetic means of communication. We should know the particulars of the color code, uh, the uh, national and cultural specific features of proxemics in communication, the role of artifacts in the, uh, in the process of business communication. It is necessary to recognize the hierarchy of the system of values of the cultures of the uh, region uh, under consideration. And it is also necessary to take into account the stereotypes of um, behavior. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you only have one minute left. And if we speak about the nonverbal aspects, it means uh, that it's important to know the symbolism of color. For example, uh, white is the symbol of death, uh, funerals, and so on, as distinct from the European culture. Red is the color of happiness and, and joy. Different gestures are very important because uh, but, but if you don't know that, you can offend the counterpart even without noticing it. Uh, gifts are also an important factor. In the Asian culture, uh, you should make it as inconspicuously as possible without emphasizing it, uh, which is characteristic, uh, on the contrary, of European culture. So uh, it's very important to impart this knowledge to the students as we teach them um, uh, business English. 
uh, so that they would be able to conduct negotiations and talks and communicate with their partners. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Are there any questions? So far, there are no questions. I would like to ask you uh, how, uh, well, uh, what you have talked about is uh, built into the curriculum. Yes, uh, it is built into our curriculum. I work at the Department of Translation and translation studies, and we have a, a special cluster of topics uh, within, uh, within um, teaching English, uh, where we discuss different cultural uh, specific features of different regions. Uh, we teach students the importance of knowing the etiquette uh, of communication uh, in the Asian uh, region, uh, particularly in the uh, countries where regional uh, variations of the language have emerged. Uh, could you tell us whether you invited uh, the native speakers from these countries? Did you use them as consultants? Yes, of course, we are uh, working with the people from the Chinese offices of different companies, the Chinese branches uh, working in uh, St. Petersburg. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Uh, I would like to say something else. Uh, thank you very much, Vasilisa uh, Vitalievna, for your presentation. Uh, in your uh, introductory part, you mentioned the phonetic aspect. Uh, do you believe that this component should be included into the curriculum? Uh, what do you think should be done? Do you think we should simply teach the people uh, to take it into account? Or do you think that uh, the counterparts uh, should also depart from the uh, received pronunciation and imitate this version. I think that would have been very complicated. We don't teach this variation, uh, regional variation, but we uh, we teach our students to perceive this uh, regional variation uh, of the English language correctly. Um, we mostly work with the people who represent the Chinese culture, they understand us uh, when we speak uh, received uh, English, received, when we use received pronunciation, they usually understand us quite well. But once when I was interpreting at a business conference um, for one of the uh, companies, uh, which, uh, uh, which builds ships, it's a transnational uh, company, and I was translating uh, a person who came from Hong Kong. I didn't understand about 30% of what he said, because I was not used to this pronunciation, uh, which departs from uh, received pronunciation. And about 30% of what I was interpreting was simply lost. So we think that the most important thing is to be able to uh, perceive everything, to perceive this different version of um, uh, the phonetic uh, aspect uh, correctly. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like you to stop uh, the regime of sharing the screen. And we would like to go on to the next uh, uh, report. And the next speaker is Maria Voskresenska, representing Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, Russia, who will speak on teaching professional cross-cultural communication in the context of dialogue and non-dialogue of cultures to more students. Good afternoon. Yes. Yes, I think I'll cope with that. Thank you. My colleagues, do you hear me well? Yes, that's that's great. We can hear you well. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Maria Sergeyevna, I just want to to show the to press the F five button so that we can see the presentation properly. Okay. Yes, that's that works right right now. 
I'm glad to welcome you. I'm glad to see you today and uh, also thank the organizers of the conference. Thank you for finding an opportunity to gather us today. It is of utmost import importance to us. It's quite important to stay in contact and uh, interchange the scientific research and our findings. So you can see the topic of my presentation of my statement today. The traditional system of education, uh, generally speaking, it is not adequately responding to the changes that are occurring in the world. So it's slow on the uptake, so to say. There are many things that define a professional portfolio of all the teachers. And uh, Elena Genrichovna stated that this approach is a key priority when it comes to modernizing the education. And the, the key feature of uh, her approach is the intercultural approach to modernization of the education process. I would like to highlight that this is a just statement. Her approach is aimed at tackling all the controversies of today's situation. Taking into account the conflict nature of many situations today, we need to change our approach. We need to make it flexible and human oriented. This is a real instrument this is a, a truly effective instrument, I would say, that should be within uh, the capacity, within the capacity of every teacher. As for the law students, so they need to understand the confrontational character of their profession and of the confrontational nature of what they do. So if we talk about an international law student, they can act as a, an intermediary between different entities. So this controversy may have a number of consequences that arise in the relations between different entities, different actors of the law process. The foreign language competence is essential for law students, and it should take into account the dichotomy of the culture and the confrontational character of their profession. The dialogue and non-dialogue of cultures is a key priority for lingua didactics today. Many scientists note that achieving comprehension between different stakeholders is essential. Respect is also of utmost importance in this sphere. We have seen that the ambivalency of intercultural communication is sometimes not reflected in the education process. There is the so-called confrontation of our, our something that belongs to us, I mean, and something that is foreign to us. So the dichotomy of dialogue and non-dialogue must transform the education when it comes to teaching a foreign language. We need to revise the foreign education, the foreign language education uh, system. So several scientists have paid attention to this feature, to this tendency. And uh, among other tendencies, we can uh, note uh, several scientists that have worked in this sphere. The scientists also pay attention to the professional lingua didactics. They aim at providing the comprehension between actors that 
are within different culture areas. The mediation is important as well. We have come up with a special reference book and uh, we have elaborated a typology of uh, the law and political discourse. So you can uh, see that on my slide. We have analyzed some samples from a French language law book. That was a kind of a manual. And that is a truly changing phenomenon. The genres of discourse are it, the genres of discourse are really different, and that affects their constructivity and their efficiency. We think that this typology is of utmost importance since that could foster the education. Without any doubt, conflict genres of discourses must be analyzed when it comes to the master programs, particularly when students are at the level C1 or C2. So this is critical to forming their language competence. As for different genres of different types of uh, law discourse, you can see that there can be conflict discourses and constructive discourses. That is the key element that defines the, the aims of the actors as well for this type of uh, discourse. I mean, the conflict type. The actors will try to achieve the best the best position so they are not able to so they are not willing to compromise at a certain point as for some competences that are typical for the level of language competences as shown on the slide you can see them so when a student is able to operate in a hostile atmosphere and um, is able to give arguments to his position and when a student is able to counter someone's position. So all these competences are essential. So we have shown you the main components of uh, foreign language education for the law students. We hope that lingua didactic potential of the discourse will be revealed in the near future since uh, there are not so many scientific works on this topic. So that was the end of my presentation and I'm ready to answer all the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Maria Sergeyevna. Do you have any questions? I mean, our colleagues. There are no questions so far. Marie Sergeyevna, I have a question for you. You have stated that uh, this is uh, this a basis for your uh, thesis, PhD thesis. Yes, that is true. This research is based on uh, my book that I have created particularly for law students. And we have studied the constructive type of discourse, the discourse of uh, law consultation. I mean, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Maria, again, I have a small question for you. What would you recommend to the participants of the law discourse that are not familiar with uh, any foreign language, so they cannot speak that, uh, any foreign language at the C1 or C2 level. Are there any strategies of the verbal behavior of such um, actors? Well, 
Oh, thank you for your question. No, of course, the situation is uh, determined by the language competence. That is true. The, those are the basic competences that are included uh, in the C1 or C2 level. It's quite difficult to talk in uh, generic terms. If we talk about B1 or B2 levels, at these levels, we have taught our students to conduct a successful law consultation. We go from simple things to more complicated and sophisticated ones. I think that our colleagues from GIMO University have an opportunity to teach students with C1 or C2 level. And they are able to teach them to participate in a realistic situation, so to say. I mean, some law disputes, judicial disputes. So, so we need to attribute great importance to that. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Do you hear me well? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you for your answer. It is uh, really exciting to learn all the findings that you have presented today. Thank you, Maria Sergeyevna. If there are no more questions, uh, we will uh, go back to our second brief. Yes, I will. Thank you for switching off your presentation. Fatima uh, Ivanovna Valiva is uh, here with us, and uh, she uh, comes uh, from Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. Uh, Fatima Ivanovna, are you ready? Yes, I am. But unfortunately, I think that my camera doesn't function properly. So I will, I, I, I'm afraid that you won't see me today, but I hope that the presentation will be shown properly. Press uh, F5 to make it a full screen presentation. What else can you press? Maria Garivna, can you help us uh, demonstrating the slides button can also be pressed? I think in the upper uh, menu. Yes. Uh, so far. Does it help? Okay, now it's fine. Everything's fine. So uh, we would like to present our research, which is entitled Cross-Cultural Analysis of the Particularities of the Professional Adaptation of Young Foreign Language Teachers, uh, the case of Spain and Russia. Uh, well, the topic is very important because uh, uh, now mobility uh, of young uh, teachers has become very high. So their professional motivation, adequate self-appraisal, and uh, the ability or inability to take decisions. Uh, well, we discussed also their um, uh, personal characteristics uh, according to Gordon and the group that worked with him. Uh, there are certain uh, personal characteristics and the situation can be regulated and the possibility of regulating uh, a successful adaptation or making it more successful uh, if uh, the young teachers and his or her colleagues in a foreign country uh, know how to tackle this. Uh, well, it is also very important to minimize the negative uh, 
the circumstances, all the impediments to uh, the young teacher's successful adaptation. It is particularly important when there is a certain um, change in the psychological attitudes. Uh, this uh, research can be of great value for those who are planning to go uh, to other countries to teach a foreign language or for those uh, who uh, are choosing the potential trainees. So the topic has been chosen by us because such an adaptation professional and social uh, of young uh, language teachers is very important to make their work effective. And our research helps prevent such negative consequences as um, uh, the lowering of their professional motivation and the effectiveness of their work. And of course, the subjects which we analyzed have already been mentioned. And uh, I would like to get down to the essence of our research. Uh, what were our tasks? Uh, to uh, study the notion of professional adaptation in uh, modern literature on pedagogics and psychology to consider the factors which influence the process of professional adaptation of young teachers uh, to hold a pile of research in order to identify the most important factors of such professional adaptation of young uh, for language teachers in Russia and Spain. Uh, on the basis of this, we also devised a certain research toolkit. Uh, we also held uh, a concluding experiment uh, in order to identify the most uh, meaningful factors of professional adaptation. And we uh, also sought to adapt the result of such adaptation in Russia and Spain. Uh, we base our research on the papers of uh, Russian and foreign experts, whose names you see uh, in the slide. And the methods uh, which were used was um, you know, ask, uh, well, surveys, uh, internet um, surveying uh, of our uh, respondents. Uh, asking them to fill in questionnaires and certain methods of processing the data. Let us define the notion of professional adaptation. Uh, Slastinin and Kashirin describe it as the process of uh, a young uh, expert or a young uh, professional coming into the profession and harmonizing uh, his interaction with the professional environment. Kaye Valieko defines the process as the process which goes beyond uh, mastering the professional skills by a person, but also including the adaptation uh, to the organizations, its tasks, and the working environment uh, as a whole. So these are primary and secondary professional adaptations. Usually such adaptation goes through several stages and continues um, you know, for a Con a considerable period of time, Viri Shagin describes such stages, the psychological and physiological, psychological professional adaptation and social uh, psychological. The first one is uh, the person is uh, when the person is getting used to the physical um, uh, surroundings at the workplace. Uh, and of course, the uh, psychological uh, features of a teacher should be adapted to the uh, ethics of a new um, organization when the person um, has to change some of the uh, behavioral uh, modes. Uh, there are different classifications of factors which uh, contribute to a successful professional adaptation. And uh, the most important uh, thing is the external factors and the internal factors. So the external ones don't uh, uh, depend on the person, but they are simply material and social. But, and of course, the internal ones have to do with his motivation and the requirements and his readiness to adapt to these requirements. Uh, the external ones always include uh, the uh, conditions of work, uh, the um, environment, the psychological atmosphere in the uh, community of people working in one organization. Since we were 
uh, analyzing the adaptation, the professional adaptation of a young um, uh, university graduate. So we decided that uh, we should define what we understand as a young um, expert, uh, the, the age uh, we, uh, the age was defined as uh, not more than 35 years old. Uh, the essence of pedagogical activities and the competences of young teachers. The pedagogical activity uh, is a special kind of social activity uh, aimed at transferring um, the um, cultural heritage and experience from the older to the younger generations and the creation of conditions for their personal development and um, to make them ready to uh, play certain social roles in, um, uh, in society. And the competences which the Council of Europe singles out are social and political, those uh, which have to do with life in a multicultural society, communicative ones, uh, those connected with intercultural communication and so on. Uh, what was our uh, research toolkit? Uh, we uh, used the uh, questionnaire analysis of the influence of non-academic and academic factors on the uh, process of professional adaptation, a book which exists, and another methodological guide. Uh, the uh, respondents were uh, selected according to uh, this principle. Respondents uh, that were used in our pilot research. We defined the characteristics which uh, a young a uh, teacher should have in order to uh, start this process of professional adaptation. And here you see that the overall number was 30 people, 17 from Russia and 13 from uh, Spain. Uh, they were more or less the same age uh, and there was some difference in experience. Both groups singled out the importance of uh, overall pedagogical competence uh, and the ability to plan teacher uh, to plan their classes and but the Spanish teachers actually stress uh, that it is important to have the intercultural skills uh, and uh, probably this is accounted for by the fact that many foreign students come to Spain to study Spanish. So the importance of this cross-cultural communication uh, skill was very important. Among the non-academic skills, Russians uh, stress the importance of being able to communicate with people uh, and making them uh, feel uh, at, at ease. Uh, uh, so the Russian uh, experts stress the importance of social skills, which means that our uh, teachers are geared to the uh, social uh, co and community skills, while the Spanish uh, teachers uh, stress the importance of being able to control oneself and the ability to um, uh, expand their knowledge continuously. Uh, now, uh, we also organized a, a concluding uh, experiment uh, to be able to, make, to draw uh, conclusions after this uh, experiment and after this pilot project. And we, uh, we uh, invited people from high schools, people from universities. Uh, uh, the work experience was uh, from several months to several years. And here you see the process data. Uh, you see that the most uh, crisis uh, genic factor is the influence of external um, external factors for a Russian for Russians the lack of uh, being geared to the new and for the Spanish uh, teachers uh, the uh, the lack of ability to control and self-assess oneself and this is quite uh, important 
uh, because uh, it shows different uh, different factors which are important for uh, teachers from Spain and Russia. But the negative uh, in influence of external uh, circumstances uh, it was assessed as important by both groups, Spanish and Russian teachers, uh, which both groups of teachers stressed. That is, uh, they cannot change this situation, but the administrative work, the leadership of the uh, schools they work in uh, should do a lot here. Uh, Spanish teachers in the pilot uh, research uh, pointed out the importance of being open to the world. Uh, maybe that's why uh, the uh, importance of continuous improvement of one's knowledge. Maybe uh, the Russian uh, teachers or the Russian respondents, uh, respondents did not uh, understand the importance of the concept which is known as lifelong uh, learning. The Spanish teachers actually said that uh, it, it was not easy to switch jobs in their country. So it was important for them to improve their knowledge and skills in their uh, job, in their workplace. Then we also analyzed uh, several uh, clusters Sorry to interrupt you. You only have a couple of minutes more. I think that will be enough. Uh, then I shall probably not speak about the correlation analysis. And here there are several clusters. Uh, and the system forming element is the factor of acquiring self-control. Uh, the other clusters also uh, reflect very important characteristics the factor of acquiring one's goals and probably one of the most important findings of our research was the factor analysis on the Russian uh, survey or, or on the survey of Russian respondents and uh, a similar one on the Spanish respondents. Uh, so the most important factors singled out by Russians was uh, eliminating all the factors uh, that uh, impede the overcoming of the crisis. The second factor, the negative influence of uh, foreign, of external circumstances. The Spanish respondents uh, had different priorities. And here you can see three factors on top. One is uh, all the factors of overcoming the crisis. Uh, the second one, uh, or the uh, lack of perspective and the factor of negative influence of external circumstances and the factor of the loss of the meaning of life, the factor of alienation and so on. Then we also uh, formulated um, our recommendations for young uh, teachers, which we uh, tested in different groups with uh, special tutors and curators. And they help uh, uh, to begin with uh, certain exercises, the situations which we play out, the method of uh, using fairy tales um, and uh, some other uh, exercises. If there are questions, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you for your presentation, Fatima Ivanovna. Uh, so far, there are no questions. I, for one, have a question. Uh, first, I would like to ask why you chose Spain as a second country for your research. And the second question maybe will seem funny to you. Uh, are the results which you receive for uh, the two countries, uh, are they uh, connected with the uh, mentality of the people and the uh, specific features of the national identity of the people. Yes, I shall start with the second question. Of course, they are closely connected uh, with the national identity, the national character, uh, but uh, irrespective of this, uh, we are not saying that we are studying only the idea, uh, the individual psychological characteristics. 
this uh, also takes into account the educational environment, the tradition. Uh, I think traditions are very important in molding the uh, personality, and it's very important which traditions are passed from generation to generation. And of course, it involves uh, very many teachers molding the character. So first and foremost, it could be determined by the national character, the national temper, so to speak. As for the first question, you said, why Spain? Why Spain was chosen as a country for comparison? Well, probably Spain was chosen because, uh, for one thing, uh, we have very good uh, contacts with Spanish universities. And participation of uh, students, uh, those I worked with, uh, well, created an atmosphere and an experience of cooperation. And we decided uh, to choose what was close to us and what we like. The second uh, author, my co-author in this uh, research, Anastasia Prokhorova, uh, knows Spanish very well, and she also cooperates with young Spanish teachers very much. So these are probably the factors. Uh, previously, we had a similar project on the educational environment in the United States of America and Germany. So now we decided to take up Spain. Thank you for your exhaustive answer. And now we go on to the next presentation. If you have more questions, you can ask them in the chat or uh, at the end of our session. So now we uh, go on uh, from a lingua didactics problem to linguistic problems. And our next uh, presenter is um, uh, Yulia Bychkova from Pirogov Russian National Research Medical University. Uh, her statement is really interesting for us uh, since uh, it uh, concerns linguistics and medicine as well. So please could you give me a hint what should I press, which button to show it properly? No, it doesn't function, unfortunately. Okay, so then uh, I'm afraid we'll see it in this format. Daria Grivna, I don't see the proper button, the, the necessary button. <laughs> You, you can see the slideshow button at the bottom. Okay, great, it, it works. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Yulia Bychkova. I come from Pirogov Russian National Research Medical University. The topic of my presentation is morphological structures and the nature of the function of genetics eponymous terms in technical literature as an element of medical vocational communicative competence formation. So the topic of my presentation and my article is uh, quite uh, um, is limited, so it is a really specialized um, research, so you know that uh, the the term the terms um, account for 6000 um, scientists and uh, doctors it's uh, not uh, for nothing that uh, famous uh, um, author fedesuk called those items a language uh, a real language monument uh, to those who contributed to the science. Uh, so as for eponymous uh, terms, they uh, are related to the names of uh, body parts uh, and uh, uh, some diseases. So that Golgi apparatus or down to antigen. So that uh, also refers to functional um, dysfunctions, uh, to dysfunctions. So like Alzheimer's disease or Kinefelter syndrome. So some uh, method or testing methods names like gram strain Edson tests and some medical laws like Darwinian fitness or uh, done forth equilibrium so these are the most common eponym eponymous terms the 
aim, the target of my article, is to study the functioning of eponymous terms in the genetics field in the specialized literature. So the material is about 100 eponymous terms from the medical um, genetics uh, field, and they were um, uh, taken from Arefiev and Lisevenko and Gorbunova books on the related topics. Uh, I want to remind you that the medical genetics uh, studies uh, the uh, hereditary features, the role of genetic factors in pathology and the methods of diagnosis and uh, um, curing some um, hereditary diseases. So new fields arrive, uh, um, arise like genetic engineering, and uh, the findings are also used in uh, industry, in medical industry, industry in uh, biological and chemical industry for curing some diseases, for producing particular medicaments. Uh, um, uh, embryology, biology are also concerned, uh, so we can uh, say without any doubt that these are the cutting edge uh, fields of uh, biology. Coronavirus, for example, is uh, treated with the coronavirus vaccine that uh, has a gen genomic um, item installed in it. The material for the research was the online journal Medscape that is a modern online resource for doctors and specialists. There are many original publications at this website. There are news concerning medicine and news concerning some pharmaceuticals. And uh, we have studied about 130 pages of these uh, of these news and of these articles and eponymous terms are present uh, they, they're in different terms i mean uh, like different models of eponymous terms proper name uh, with s at the end and name there are some abbreviations uh, like uh, mac kuhn albright syndrome so uh, the multi-component so there is a multi-component abbreviation. There is also a variation of this type. Uh, sometimes uh, some components are omitted when it comes to uh, term collocations. And there are some tactical variants as well, like Langar Hansen's eyelet. So there is an orthographic variation as well. So at this page, you can see different uh, samples from Medscape Journal. And there are given two possible types of types of writing the Alzheimer's disease. So you can also see Graves bar baseball disease is sometimes uh, used as an alternative. There are also there are also abbreviation abundant in uh, those articles. So you can see Alzheimer's disease or Down syndrome are sometimes um, cutted, abbreviated into just two letters. During the research, we have found something. The eponymous uh, term, the, the eponymous terms work in uh, different variants uh, in uh, the specialized literature, and uh, the variation is um, it means that there is a language abundance and evolution. Abundance and variation is always a source for progress, for finding new words. So what conclusions can be made? Since the target of a specialized article, like a conference article or a conference statement, in, uh, there are some priorities that must uh, be focused on while preparing specialized literature like uh, informativity, clarity, and logic. So what we can say, the abbreviations and eponymous, term, er, eponymous terms um, are due to the greater flow of information uh, great outreach of social media, outreach of uh, scientific information. 
and but that is particularly important for uh, for those who specialize in this field then you can see several exercises on eponymous terms and they are made for medical university students they are aimed at fostering their competence the first exercise is aimed at finding the correct um, collocation for a disease or for an object and after that you should fit the appropriate collocation in the gap so that is that the, those are the correct answers coffee cells tendon capsule and krebs cycle this is an exercise that is aimed at improving the language competence and uh, the aim of it is uh, to master the knowledge of eponymous terms basing on the eponymous terms with proper names and another exercise i would like to show you uh, is uh, to put the correct collocation on the image so you can see an image of some uh, body organs some body parts so you so a student should find the correct collocation probably some of you know that do you know the correct answer so you the stocking tube is located at the bottom what conclusion can be made after um, revising this research uh, specialized english must take into account uh, fostering competences, appropriate competences, I mean. And they, um, general English must be taught in a totally different way compared to other universities. Sometimes the vocabulary of students is not elaborated, it's not that wide as is required. And the aim of educating students at medical universities is uh, to make them prepared for professional um, for, for professional work the linguistic component of uh, this competence is um, um, a key priority for us that is why the english for specific purposes is uh, an essential it is a, a is an essential pillar for preparing professionals the program is different from teaching other courses of English. I mean, English for specific purposes is based on a different uh, curriculum. They uh, also use authentic materials. They are connected with concrete uh, specialized discipline, and they also broaden the outlook of students. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Yulia Alexeyevna. Uh, does anyone have questions on this? Well, there are no questions right now. Yulia Alexeyevna, I uh, have a question related to medicine. Could you tell us uh, where eponyms come from? Who is the decision maker in this term? So what, uh, who defines which uh, eponymous term is to be included in the medical vocabulary and uh, how much time passes uh, right from the creation of this eponymous term for instance there is uh, a finding in the medical sphere and afterwards it's named after someone yes that is a um, peculiar and it's an interesting question indeed but the uh, since the that since medicine requires a lot of time some um, researchers that uh, found a fragment of or body part um, can produce an eponym, actually. So uh, there are some diseases or, or dysfunctions, dis, uh, dysfunctions that are named after scientists. But actually, that might work not only with scientists. Uh, some uh, people elaborate special methods of investigation or so on and so forth or so, so i mean generally people who um, design a special testing system uh, i would like to mention the syndrome of van gogh so van gogh is not 
someone coming from the medical sphere, as you know. Uh, but uh, since uh, he cut his ear, uh, uh, syndrome was named after him. So is it that the international medical community that decides on this issue? Yes, that might happen in several countries simultaneously. And uh, several scientists, uh, several international scientists um, concur with finding something. So that might be uh, named after them. I think that the international medical community is uh, responsible for taking the decision on uh, eponymous names, uh, on eponymous terms. Well, for instance, uh, they uh, see a finding and they name this finding, this uh, object uh, after the scientist. And they also put that in the documents. So if there are no other questions. Uh, I would like to proceed to our next briefer from uh, Alicante University. I hope that I pronounce the name correctly, Ruben Medina Serrano from the University of Alicante from Spain. Дарья Игоревна, does Ruben Medina Serrano, does he hear interpretation? Good morning, everybody. Hello, and good. It's your turn now. Okay, okay, great, great. Then I will try to share my presentation. One second. Нам, видимо, нужно переключиться на секцию перевода всем, чтобы услышать перевод. Извините, а если будет лекция, а если будет выступление на английском языке, может быть, только... Мне кажется, да, что мы сейчас должны все нажать на перевод внизу. What if he speaks English? Well, I think that you have to use the services of interpreters. There is a button you have to press, like the globe. You have to switch to Russian. The interpreters will speak Russian. Let me know when you when you see my presentation. I don't know if it's now available. One second. Is there? Yeah. When, if it's possible. No, I see, see only a part of it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Let, let uh, me know. Okay. It's better this time. It's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. One. One second. Yeah. So, um, hello, um, everybody. Uh, um, my name is Ruben Medina, and uh, I am a P PhD student from the University of Alicante. I am um, I am studying uh, translations, especially in three languages: English, German, and Spanish. And uh, I am pleased to take part of this conference. And I will really welcome you to to the topic of today concerning the contrastive analysis of expressions used in audit management, cross-cultural communication of teaching audit, audit management. And let me go through. Yeah. So teaching, teaching literature has evolved rapidly in the last decade. However, mobile learning literature for the pair language uh, English, German is still scarce. Also, much of the literature focuses on traditional teaching and traditional audit methodology. During the years 2020 and 2021, this year, COVID-19 COVID uh, COVID pandemic restrictions had a negative impact on logistics and performance, traditional teaching and on-site audit activities. One second. Uh, this research analyzed the existing literature as it pertains to past and current trends, identifying existing gaps, developing a single class related following the theory of growth uh, in terms of auditing, learning, and teaching, defined as norm, norm learn, learning to support practitioners and researchers 
during the teaching and auditing activities. So our firms, the research questions, our firms expecting that practitioners in general and auditors in particular are aware of using computer assisted, assisted translations and information and communication technologies tools efficiently and to perform audit and teaching activities. Do academics and practitioners employ mobile learning methodologies for, for teaching and training purposes? So the one of the aims of this research is the review and analyze the past literature of phraseological units, collect evidences of collocations and lessons learned of using ICT and CAD tools through a case study and guide and help practitioners and academics during online teaching and auditing remotely in particular. This research aims to make new contributions to the current literature in order to help academics and practitioners improve their teaching and auditing skills in changing environments in an efficient way, like uh, the years we are, we are facing now concern related to COVID-19. So the, this research uh, follows the, the model of split in six parts, which are identifying the problem and motivate, defining the objectives of a solution, design and development, demonstration, evaluation, and communication. And just to give you a, a short picture of about my thesis, so it's defined it's split in four, in four parts. The introduction, where it's focusing on managerial relevance of equivalence translation and, and phraseologic. And then second part with research works, which including the, the, the research work which are, are I'm presenting today to you. And the third part, the conclusion and implication, and finally, the appendix. The methodology. Um, literature review in the ProQuest and Google Scholar academic databases was performed, and the case study focused on a leading manufacturer of electronic products is used. This firm is a global player based in Germany with um, almost uh, 1,690 employees and a turnover of 246 million euros. The firm was chosen mainly because of its need to improve the audit activities remotely due to COVID-19 restriction and also teaching the partners how to do it and how to perform audits remotely. And the method of this research is, is based on qualitative data analysis conduct following Miles and Huberman methodology, which uh, is split in three steps. First of all, data reduction, qualitative data was collected through a set of interviews at the firm, and also by analyzing existing documents and the literature available. The second one is the data display. The analysis of mass data was displayed in the form of table, charts, and other graphical formats. And finally, the analysis review was the basis to draw general conclusions, verify and validate the study. So let me um, show you um, uh, one of the tables related to audit terminology and, and more or less uh, also related to this collocation on, in the audit field. So what is audit criteria? Audit criteria is a set of requirements used as a reference against which objective references compare, which is an audit evidence, records, statements, or facts of other information which are relevant to the audit criteria are verifiable, which is um, audit findings. Results of the evaluation of the collected audit evidence against audit criteria. So finally, audit conclusion, outcome of an audit, audit considerations of the audit objectives and all of audit findings. It's, it's really important to have a standardized terminology when, when you perform teaching in audit management and also in a cross-functional and, and, and multicultural discipline 
where you where you are located or where you are have teaching um, activities with firms located in different countries, it's important to use um, and standardize literature and terminology, which is translated in this in this study in English, German, and Spanish. So how can we teach and which methodology can we use also for practitioners to perform audit activities in the practice? So due to COVID-19 restrictions, um, a lot of ICT tools have been employed. And um, as, as, as you know, and, and, and we use now Zoom, there are different ICT tools to be used like Google Hangouts, um, Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, U Meetings, Cisco WebEx, and all these platforms allow us to teach remotely in an audit, in audit um, field and in other fields also. And also for performing audit, as you can see from the picture, these virtual reality glasses. So how can, how can you use it? So as you can imagine, you can have, for example, a session with Zoom and start in the, in the mobile phone of um, the audit partners or the students. And they can start, they can start uh, with, with this mobile phone. They can set it in, in the real uh, virtual glasses. And uh, it is possible to have an, a, a, a conversation interactive also with the audits and also see what the, what is uh, in the in the other side through the the glasses so it's really interesting and it has been employed during this case study as a way for teaching and also perform uh, audits remotely well well coming back to the to the grammar and collocations which kind of tools do we have to use the 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 corp the, the body the body language and the and the corpus of of, of the of uh, different languages in in the practice so this is an example as you can see this is the sketch tool the the word the sketch tool shows the most typical collocations and word combination of its word in in a language and um, also for teaching it's very practice because you can use for example, Arabic, British, Chinese, Danish, Dutch, English, French, even Russian. And, and you have also the possibility to, to teach the corpus from, from that tool, analyze collocations. And, and this, for example, for example, you can use which collocations uh, from a, a specific lemma, for example, uh, agreement or audit um, has this corpus and um, with a kind of uh, minimum frequency, for example, more than five results for the word agreement. And yeah, this is an example of which... Yeah, um, and we're coming to also to the conclusions. Our findings have highlighted that there is a trend to use CAD tools, integrating artificial intelligence solutions like people to perform translations quickly, which helps enormously for, the, for teaching. And also there is an interchanging information available through platforms, ICT platforms like Skype, like Zoom, and, and, and this can be really used for learning and, and also for teaching and also in the praxis. And nowadays, this mobile learning, this mobile teaching is still, is, 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 is accelerate, is a start deeply from, from the COVID-19 restrictions, like also learning through podcasts, like um, this mobile learning table using 
tables, usual, using uh, all kinds of mobile devices. And um, I see this is this is coming up uh, in the next in the next years will be more and more more important for the the teaching perspectives. And this research work also verified and validate uh, the results through the case study. And this research presents relevant dimensions and factors to be studied and evaluate possible outcomes when approaching online teaching and perform audits remotely. This study contributes to enrich the literature related to phraseological units, as, as, as we, we saw using tools like a sketch tool, which analyzes collocation, phraseological units is very useful. And also the use of uh, virtual, virtual devices like virtual reality glasses for learning and audit per perspectives. So at this point, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. Please do not hesitate to contact me. And if you have any question, please just, just ask me or later on. So, espasivo tsa unimanije. Thank you very much. Мы благодарим господина Сирана за его интереснейший доклад. A little more about the virtual reality glasses. This is an absolutely new technology. So far, I have not heard anything about uh, uh, this device in teaching uh, a language and informing some la language competences. Mr. Serrano? Uh, I have already translated it. About the use of virtual reality glasses in, yeah. in teaching. Yeah, um, the, the point is that with um, the, the use of virtual reality glasses, you can imagine you can uh, use or the other party can, can take a telephone, a mobile phone using Zoom, for example, and, and can, uh, can set at the virtual reality glasses and can also share exercises who is maybe teaching at the same time or maybe writing or maybe also share exercises or um, also interact or show different places and in audit field many times um, you you maybe also go to some rooms to to go through where, where you you have uh, you need the mobility and in order to you help you with this mobility, you can use the reality glasses to share that. And yeah, and for for practical point of view, it's possible maybe if the student want to show you something um, in 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 the room or something what what he did or what whatever he he was who was doing. Um, it's, it's you can see from the glasses the same what the students see. So in in the same time. I'm not I'm not sure if I I, I answer your question. Of maybe you can and un, you can imagine how does it work. So like like you wear um, glasses and the other person can see the same as you see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, so I think that we should go back to our common uh, common hall, so the general hall, I think. Do you hear me well? I hope um, everyone hears me. So I hear you, but I didn't quit the One second, please. Uh, Ruben, uh, please, uh, could you turn off your mic, please? 
And could you turn off your presentation? Okay, thank you. The presentation was uh, very interesting indeed. So now we go to the next uh, statement of, by Yelena Alexandrovna Borsukova. She's from Lomonosov Moscow State University, and uh, uh, her um, article is uh, dedicated to the dynamic processes in the vocabulary in 2020. Uh, those are now um, new words. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, uh, for presenting my um, article. Uh, thank, I thank the organization committee, and um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to share my findings. And I re I'm really happy to communicate with my colleagues. And I really want to talk about uh, the dynamic process in the vocabulary of English language uh, that uh, happened last year. It is uh, quite evident uh, that the vocabulary is particularly flexible and always reacts uh, to the social and economic and political changes. And uh, the changes in vocabulary is a kind of language response uh, to non-language um, phenomena and uh, some events, there are new realities, and there is a new vision of the reality. The extra linguistic uh, impetus uh, results uh, in uh, the language transformation. Every era has every year has um, a, a particular vocabulary that is specific, uh, that is um, very different from the vocabulary of the past days. So this is uh, the case today. What can we say about the year 2020? Last year, the most uh, frequent uh, terms used during the, uh, that year, during the pandemics, uh, were the adjectives, uh, adject adjectives uh, crazy, strange, lost, uh, and unprecedented. English language has uh, changed very rapidly. I mean, has reacted very rapidly. There are new, there, there are new items of vocabulary, and uh, they reflect the changes in the perception of this world. The real in in the real time, they can see the changes and uh, as the uh, head of the Casper Center of the Oxford, the language has reflected all the changes that happened last year. And last year, the reference books uh, violated their timeline for adding new vocabulary to the dictionaries. And that was a kind of a response to the uh, rapid changes. Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary updated the uh, vocabulary in March and in April. The Oxford uh, Dictionary also added an extra update in June and July. Moreover, at the end of the year, the Oxford uh, Dictionary decided not to, um, not to choose the only one word of the year. And since the reality has changed so much and the events were so truly global, one cannot choose all, a single word of the year. What is the reason of these lexical shifts and why did they update the reference books and dictionaries so uh, frequently? So in April and March, uh, coronavirus, I mean the word, the word coronavirus was one of the most frequent in the English language uh, and uh, COVID-19 that also um, was born on the, in February, last February, there is also an exact date of its birth, the 11th of February. And in April, uh, several months after the birth of this um, word, this was one of the most frequent uh, words in the English language. And of course, it was one of the words of the year. New context and uh, new words are particularly interesting to students and they add uh, impetus to the interest of their um, education. 
And this can, that can be used uh, as a professional tool uh, to increase the, and foster the competence of uh, foreign language uh, students and um, our students as well. And there are several criteria according to which the words are considered as uh, neologies, no new words, that is, uh, for example, frequency, uh, that the research is based on the Oxford Dictionary, and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and the updates of April and March, and the glossary of new words and buzzwords of Macmillan Dictionary. New words, neologisms are separated in several groups. I, uh, they, they are the following. The first one is the name of the disease. The second is preventive uh, measure and preventive measures in general, some epidemiological uh, terms, and uh, confinement um, and all the words related to quarantine and confinement. We can see that there are uh, several lingodidactics the lingodidactical uh, targets. Particularly, we can see something while analyzing the updates of 2020. Particularly, we see a word formation that is proliferating and is becoming more frequent. And um, we can also demonstrate this process in an English foreign language class uh, while giving the examples from the COVID-19 uh, epidemics. This virus um, arised last year, and uh, so it appeared last year, and there are many names for this virus, like uh, CV, C19, Corona, Rona. So we can see that this um, vocabulary item is particularly flexible. This is due to the attention of social media and uh, some um, other words were formed with the COVID um, word like pre-COVID, post-COVID, covid coronials. I, so coronials are babies that were born um, while there was a, while there were confinement measures during the quarantine. The social importance of any phenomenon can foster the transition of an item to the general vocabulary. So it becomes a general uh, term, a common place, and we could um, we can have a look at many um, numerous examples like R number, flattened curve, patient zero, super spreader. So uh, of course these words existed. I think that they were coined at the beginning of the 20th century, but now they have become general terms and almost everyone uses them. Moreover, the vocabulary related to pandemics gives us a number of professionalisms that also penetrate the general vocabulary. There are some regional peculiarities of using abbreviations and uh, vocabulary related to the pandemics, like Corona, also, or like for isolation, SANI, for hand sanitizers that are used in English speaking countries. Of course, we are not familiar with that in Canada, Australia, uh, and the USA. These um, things are used. But in the USA, I would like to note that this word is not considered as a generic term. So that is more or less uh, something that evokes uh, negative feelings towards it. Shelter in place, for example, is used for instead of lockdown. So they always try to mitigate their negatives psychological impact. Um, and now we can say that shelter in place has become a new vocabulary item. Last year, we also saw shifts in collocational patterns. 
sometimes a particular meaning of the of a word becomes uh, more popular becomes more commonly used for instance the mm, remote uh, collocations are uh, given on the slides so sometimes remote remote is uh, used about uh, ge about geographical distance but in 2020 remote is used about remote technologies online conferencing and meetings so zoom has also changed its meaning in uh, 2019 uh, the, it was used um, mainly with optical with um with words like optical click lens like optical zoom uh, zoom lens in 2020 the collocations have shifted and now uh, we say via zoom zoom meetings and so on and so forth we also see the transformation of meanings of some vocabulary items we need to draw the attention of our students to such items like self-isolate. This presents a particular interest to us, and this is a vocabulary item that gives us an opportunity to see the evolution of this word. So this is not a new word, that's not a neologism. We cannot say that there is a new meaning that was added to it. In 1984, this example was uh, used in the political context, and uh, we can see an example. Uh, there, is a, um, there are some words about the self-isolation of the Soviet Union, and uh, now the meaning of the collocation hasn't changed, but it has changed the common use the common usage patterns. There are some newly coined words like infodemic and to zoom, so they changed uh, from the verb, from the noun to the verb. And now we can um, use it as a very telling example of the conversion of words. We can state that the new words of 2020 and uh, the vocabulary that uh, appeared during this period gives a chance uh, to achieve a number of targets, particularly that could increase the allocation competence of students, first uh, broaden their outlook and generally uh, increase their foreign language competence. So that is the end of my presentation. I thank you for uh, your attention. So are there any questions uh, to uh, Elena Alexandrovna? Um, I have uh, a small, I would like to make a remark on your, uh, on your presentation. Uh, I also work with neologisms, but uh, not non-verbal. And the, 2020, the year 2020 gave us a number of non-verbal neologisms like uh, the greeting uh, gestures. So uh, some greeting gestures that didn't involve uh, physical contact. Uh, and uh, sometimes that is not mentioned uh, during uh, common classes uh, since that's not the target of our education process, uh, but still I would like to um, uh, ask you a question. So how can we organize the work, uh, the mastering of competence so when it comes to new words um, at the classes? So should we um, develop particular exercises for this purpose or not? Oh, well, thank you for your remark. This is a very interesting question indeed. You know, um, for several years, I have been uh, using uh, the buzzwords uh, list uh, of Macmillan Dictionary, but unfortunately, they have stopped uh, the um, updates. Um, they have stopped updating. Um, um, 
the list. And so Carrie Maxwell, who she's a lexicographer, and she was responsible for updating this uh, list. And uh, sometimes uh, during our classes, we practiced the following. Students could choose a buzzword that uh, looked uh, nice, that <laughs> looked interesting to them, and they were just uh, trying to work with it. I think that uh, students are enthusiastic about new words. Yes, they um, they are uh, really glad to do to um, do such tasks. So, if there are no more questions, uh, no more further questions, then we will uh, go on to our next uh, brief. Unfortunately, Elena Konstantinovna Timofeyeva is absent today. Probably she will join us later. Uh, um, Ruslan Talgatovich Sadov uh, and uh, Yekaterina Timirbaeva are also not present right now, but I hope that we will hear them afterwards. Now um, we will um, go to the next, um, our next briefer. This is uh, Andrei Levisky and Ksu Yudan. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Now I'm going to share my screen with you for you to be able to see the slides. I'm pressing share the screen and for some reason it wouldn't obey me. Uh, wait a minute. I hope you can see it now. Can you? Uh, Elena Borisovna, uh, switch on the mic. Yes, we can see the presentation, but please use the full screen regime. It will be better seen. F5. F5. No? Then could you press uh, showing the slides? Let's try this one. No, it wouldn't obey me. I have tried both uh, your recommendations. Something's wrong with the uh, settings. Sorry. Well, now everything's fine. Okay, now that seems better. So, dear colleagues, I'm presenting uh, my um, topic together with a postgraduate student from the uh, People's Chinese Republic who is now in China and she can join us uh, now um, at the conference for a number of personal reasons, but she uh, is not analyzing the space and time um, aspects. Uh, she um, works mostly uh, on comparing the aspects of tastes uh, in Chinese and Russian, but she uh, has helped me in analyzing the factors of time and space. And uh, when I thought uh, of choosing the, uh, when I was choosing the topic, uh, I thought that it would be enough for uh, reflecting both these uh, aspects. So in the article, we were only able to include space, but I hope that now uh, I will be able to speak about both time and space and how the picture um, of the world of uh, the people of Yakima who speak uh, the uh, Shahaptin language. Um, and this is the language for Yakima, a Chishkin. Well, fairly exotic terms. This is a, an ethnic group that lives in the uh, northwest of the United States of America. Uh, they live in a preserve, in an Indian preserve, uh, preserve 
uh, special area, I was invited uh, to give lectures for a week uh, by the uh, full tide program. And uh, I was in the town of Topanish, the central uh, the town of this uh, uh, Indian uh, reservation is uh, Yakima, the same name as the people uh, call themselves. And you see the flags of uh, the ethnic group of Yakima and the United States. Uh, well, uh, in uh, different states, usually the uh, flag uh, of uh, the state is higher than the federal one, but in the uh, Yakima area, uh, the flags are at the same level. But despite this political aspect, when this territory uh, was uh, included uh, as part of the United States territory, of course, there were many people, local people, um, people of the Yakima ethnic group. Of course, many of them um, had been exterminated. And now it's a small ethnic group. Uh, but now these ethnic Americans uh, who had been exposed to this uh, melting pot uh, policy, uh, well, it brought about a situation when most of the children were sent to the so-called, uh, to what we know as boarding schools, and education was conducted uh, in English, so they forgot their own language. And by the 1980s, there was not a single person uh, in this area who could uh, speak this uh, Sahaptin language or Echishkin, Sahaptin in English. Then uh, there were people who, uh, who called themselves Yakima, and one of them, uh, the person who was defending the rights of this ethnic group uh, in the state of uh, Washington, Virginia, Beaver is her name, and Virginia Beaver started using her memories and the memories of the children uh, who uh, had been made, so to speak, to forget their own language. They started working on uh, creating dictionaries. It was done successfully, and several dictionaries were uh, published, Chishkin English and English Chishkin dictionaries. And the people who belong to this tribe, to this ethnic group, uh, they used English as a native language, but nevertheless, a dictionary was created. And now, uh, since the uh, late 1990s, a policy started to be pursued when uh, an interest was displayed in uh, reviving the history and the language of these people uh, they created a museum of that ethnic group, of that Indian tribe. You can see the art of the local artists. Uh, you see uh, the pictures uh, by the local artists that reflect the uh, everyday life and the traditions of the people. Um, the, fairy, the fairy tales of Yakima have been published. Uh, in English, and at the University uh, of the State of Washington, they even started teaching, Heritage University started even teaching this language. And here you can see uh, a lesson of Echishkin. I attended the lesson, and you see the teacher who explains the pronunciation of the word, uh, the words of sounds, so methodologically, the language was very interesting. Uh, there were not only students at the lesson, but also people from the locality 
about 10 people altogether of different ages, and they simply wanted to learn the language of their predecessors. And at first they had a phonetics drill, then they uh, learned about some of the morphological categories, then they switched to the lexis, uh, and the lesson concluded in small dialogues. And overall, I must say that uh, there must have been some progr progress because they could speak the language. And besides, I can also say this is uh, their uh, primer, uh, the ABC book. I would like to say that there is a great interest in this language. Unfortunately, now there is not a single person for whom it would be the main language of communication, even for the local people. Uh, it is uh, an additional, a second language, because of course all of them are uh, English speakers, native English speakers, but nevertheless, um, the dictionary exists. I have been given it as a present. I have also bought uh, a book of fairy tales published in English because so far they haven't published any books in their own language. You can see here the study of the uh, teacher of this language. And of course, the most important concepts for them are space and time. And the concepts which were the most actively used in the fairy tales and in the legends reflected the space and the time. And uh, speaking about space, the subconcepts of ocean, lake, uh, valley, and we shall speak about them in a minute. Space, here you see the internet space and uh, the ocean, uh, the most widespread image of the ocean in Yandex. As for the subconcept of the ocean, in this Sahaptin language, it is objectively described as atej, which is derived from the root ata, which means uh, vast, big, gigantic, and uh, chish, which means water. And in fact, the territory where these people, uh, where these people, uh, lives where these people live is not far from the uh, Pacific Ocean, and they have a mountain chain uh, which separates the valley where the people live from the ocean. So for them, uh, it's not the sea that is important, but the ocean, so to speak. Uh, sorry, uh, but you have a very few minutes left. Okay, uh, the ocean includes uh, the uh, seas of uh, salty water and the coast. And what uh, makes uh, Russian uh, and uh, English uh, distinct from this language uh, is that we use the Greek root of this word and uh, both languages use it. In the Chinese, uh, the word yang is used as the verbal of this concept. And uh, we speak about a water space, which is larger than the sea. And they also have uh, a semantic element of uh, space. Uh, and there is a certain uh, borderline between the ocean uh, and uh, a lake a lake uh, uh, rather than a pond, uh, are very important for the Yakima people. They don't have a man-made pond, uh, but uh, they use the same word for both lake and pond. Uh, in English, uh, uh, lake is derived from lacus, uh, which means a water uh, space, um, a big reservoir. Uh, in Chinese, it's Ku, which is a water space, uh, 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 a lake, and it is also part of the names of the provinces of Abei, Hunan, and uh, others. Uh, 
And the word valley is also an important word for Yakima. There are two uh, like scenes, uh, which are I-6, which means the estuary of the river and the valley of the river. Uh, in this case, the uh, river, uh, the Columbia River uh, gave rise to it. And the other word, uh, the other route is um, uh, level. Uh, and they see the estuary and a uh, level space, which uh, combine into one. Uh, in the English language, a uh, plain, uh, plain is also comes from planus, and in Russian also a uh, leveled uh, space. In China, Ravnina Penyuan means uh, leveled, and the second um, meaning is uh, arable land. For Yakima, uh, the word plain is very important for the uh, English, Russian, and Chinese, Chinese speakers. Uh, this is also important as part of the picture of the world, uh, but not so important as for these Indians. I think that if I have used my time, uh, then uh, I can stop. If I still have a couple of minutes, I shall add a few words about time. For Yakima, it's very important to uh, divide the uh, time of the day, uh, which comes from the word describing a bright day, uh, uh, which in English will be the same as daytime kikes. And kikes also means uh, that it's light, uh, clear. So it shows the time from the sunrise to the uh, sunset. Just like in Russian Zin, uh, they don't have uh, the uh, a special word for the 24 hours, the unit of day and night together. Uh, and the word daytime uh, is in one way or another reflected in all these languages. Um, afternoon is also uh, an important uh, word like uh, like a lexical unit. Uh, one means after the sun has passed its apogee. And in Yakima, there is a word for sun. Uh, it is derived from the language of Chinook. Uh, so afternoon um, has a similar, uh, they have a similar term to afternoon. In the Chinese, uh, language, they also have a similar word. In Russian, we usually say um, after dinner, not afternoon, but um, after lunch. Uh, so it's um, uh, a way we describe the middle of the day. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture uh, which describes the period uh, of twilight uh, for Indians, it's very important. Uh, and it is kind of a, a worship picture for them. Uh, in Russian, the time before it gets quite dark uh, is also very important. And also it has a metaphoric element before daytime and uh, the uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 it being dark, uh, the time of gradually uh, fading out. And in uh, Chinese, there is a group of characters of, uh, uh, which uh, describe the same time, but it means something like uh, uh, nearing the evening. There is no special lexical unit for uh, twilight. And now I would like to thank you for your attention. And why do I uh, have daffodils here? Uh, simply because uh, this is the, these are the flowers they uh, welcomed me with. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. You have questions to the presenter. I have a question. Uh, I have a question about the concept of space. Why didn't you 
include such concepts as uh, the mountain and the river. Thank you very much for this question because uh, I was actually uh, getting ready to speak a little more. Uh, in Yakima, every mountain has its own proper name and they don't have a word which would verbalize the concept of mountain. It's simply not non-existent. And the highest mountain is called uh, that which uh, is the first to welcome the sun. Uh, I won't be able to say it in Egyptian language, but what is the essence? Uh, at the University of Dopelish, all the buildings are one story houses, uh, trailers, uh, in order for the uh, people uh, to feel comfortable. They don't want the buildings uh, to close the holy mountain. They always want to have it to uh, in front of their eyes because uh, it is um, a kind of a super, um, uh, it is supervising their lives. Thank you very much. A very interesting choice of languages. And if you haven't yet, uh, had a chance to ask the questions, please uh, ask them in the chat. Now, uh, Yelena Timofeyeva from St. Petersburg State University has joined us, and she will tell us about intersubject integration in cross-linguistic and cross-cultural aspects. Yelena Konstantinna, the floor is yours. Well, I'm sorry for being late today. Well, I just have to uh, to teach my students, so I'm I'm having classes today. So, do you ha uh, need assistance in uh, showing your presentation? No, I think I'll go on my own. Do you see it well? Yes, but could you demonstrate that in the full screen by pressing F5 button? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would like to uh, make uh, my the, to, to present my brief statement today. Uh, it concerns intersubject integration and cross-linguistic and cross-cultural aspects. Oh, we see that uh, now the world is becoming more globalized and the limits of communication are becoming broader and there is getting um, more inf there are mo there's more information that concerns professional aspects and professionals with necess with um, relevant uh, competences are required in the prof professional spheres particularly in the international communication sphere and in this context the finding an efficient way of uh, teaching is particularly important. We see our target as uh, inter-subject integration. We have analyzed uh, the inter-subject uh, integrated uh, education approach. So that is called sometimes uh, CL, CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning System. So we have analyzed the experience of our predecessors and we have come up with the content and language integrated learning system and we will try to prove its efficiency and relevancy and we'll try to come up with uh, some uh, practical recommendations. The importance of uh, this uh, educational model is uh, giving the students the necessary professional competence in the sphere and the functions are uh, important as well. Uh, the um, 
cross-linguistic and cross-cultural education is important not only for teachers but uh, for Methodists uh, uh, as well and for those uh, who elaborate curriculum for universities and schools. The methodological basis of this approach uh, unites the practical, uh, educational and, uh, and educational um, targets of education. Uh, a case that could prove that thesis is uh, the cultural space of St. Petersburg initiative. Uh, it is um, aimed at Chinese students. It is uh, taught in English language, but in the context of uh, the Russian realities, it gives an opportunity uh, to find uh, the professional ways of communication and uh, fosters the intercultural understanding it uh, fosters the communicative skills and uh, it fosters the relevant competences in the one world that is particularly important the skill of working in a team and the cross-cultural competence is uh, something that is essential for any professional Studying education uh, traditions, the Chinese uh, students uh, come up with a, a, a number of uh, uh, face a number of um, obstacles. And the study of uh, these uh, educational traditions in the context of um, also, cultural cooperation gives a chance uh, to organize the educational process according to their realities and the features of the situation, and that fosters the transition period in education and uh, rises the intersubject integration. The education is generally practical, aimed at practical uh, targets. There are traditional educational methods and there are new educational methods like distance learning, some virtual uh, guided tours, project activities. And if we talk about an offline activity, that could be a survey lecture, that could be a seminar, some internship tests or exams. The implementation of this educational model enables us uh, to um, give a part of theoretical and practical material to our students in different ways. So we could send them something in uh, online format, uh, in a digital format, and this also enables um, them, enables our students to have a um, to, to make some art, artistic projects. Um, they can uh, also be prepared for uh, guide, uh, guiding some tours. Guided tours uh, now. To begin with studying the cultural space of a town, in our case, that's St. Petersburg. And they should get familiar with the relevant uh, artifacts of Chinese uh, culture that can be seen in the museums of St. Petersburg. Why have we chosen St. Petersburg? We think that uh, this is um, um, this is a city uh, that uh, has accumulated a number of uh, Chinese artifacts. Uh, unfortunately, the intercultural exchange between uh, the Russian Federation and uh, China started not so long ago, and uh, uh, Ms. Romanova was uh, one of uh, the drivers of this process. The 
and uh, after that, uh, uh, the Russian Federation decided to opt for the eastern line of uh, politics, and uh, they wanted to deal with Asian countries. So that was a brief history of uh, all those artifacts. And I also want to mention one historical episode that happened uh, during uh, the uh, Empire of Peter the Great. Nurchin Treaty was uh, signed between Russia and China. It um, this, this treaty was uh, regulating the trade between two countries for a long time, and uh, the countries uh, supplied uh, each other with unique materials. Uh, China, for instance, supplied us with ivory and uh, um, ch with China, I mean uh, some plates uh, and uh, cups. And uh, Peter the Great was the driver of the Chinese fashion. Uh, by that, I mean that the Chinese artifacts were becoming particularly popular in uh, Russia. And uh, at the uh, university uh, street in St. Petersburg, we show the, uh, them some artifacts that were acquired by Peter the Great from China. This also fosters the um, efficiency of education, since they see these, all those artifacts by themselves in real life. And uh, now we are focusing on the cultural heritage of the uh, of the Chinese culture in and in Russia as well. And that defines the interest of our students. We uh, have guided tours to Kunstkamera, to the palace of Menshikov. They are within walking distance, and uh, that uh, gives an opportunity to have an online guided tour and afterwards have an offline guided tour. So you have two or three minutes left. Uh, 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 yes, thank you for reminding me. So uh, then I will not dwell uh, into details. Um, I just want to, I just wanted today to show you that uh, this um, into uh, into subjects integration, cross linguistic and cross cultural aspect increases the interest of students in uh, to in uh, world art and in uh, acquiring better professional competences. And uh, a particular feature of uh, foreign studies in China is that uh, they um, focus on, um, on writing skills. That is why sometimes uh, Chinese uh, students do not have uh, adequate speaking skills. And sometimes they are reluctant to communicate with other people. And uh, the prism of world art and the prism of the China um, culture, so the Chinese culture and art uh, gives um, a starting point uh, to start communication and discussion. We actually, through writing, make them get used uh, to some practical speaking tasks. Uh, we try to develop their uh, communication skills uh, and we use some artifacts, cultural artifacts uh, and objects. And in this way, they get ready not only to adapt to the changing social and economic uh, context, but they also broaden their outlook. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that uh, my presentation was much shorter than I expected since uh, I was pressed for time. Thank you, Yelena Konstantinovna. Do, uh, does anyone have a question? Uh, 
So uh, then uh, I will um, ask you uh, one question. So I, I have seen your website. Uh, I have seen some guided tours for Chinese uh, students. Uh, and uh, um, uh, um, any uh, have your colleagues from other departments departments participated in this um, project yes the, there is a world art uh, department at our university and uh, they give conferences and lectures on the history of world art and so they have participated um, in this project yes that is a, a multi uh, department project i would say uh, i wouldn't uh, uh, say quite so but um, this uh, project um, is really important for the first uh, uh, first grade students uh, so that gives them an opportunity to somehow integrate in the learning environment they can adapt to some situations um, yes, I would say that, yes, we uh, try to um, uh, invite other uh, professionals uh, to cooperate with. Yes, thank you. So if uh, there are no other questions, then we give the floor to the colleague of Elena Konstantinovna. I'm sorry if I mispronounce the name, Svetlana Visharenka. Yes, she will also uh, uh, tell us something about phonetic difficulties in uh, dear colleagues unfortunately i have a very bad connection uh you can expect that it may be uh, interrupted and i have a small computer so i am not quite sure how well uh it will serve my purposes Uh, the share of foreign students who are studying uh, at different uh, faculties at different schools of our university, nobody can hear anything. We cannot hear you. No, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Something's wrong. Svetlana Vladimirovna, we can't hear you. Uh, well, and the number of such programs uh, grows from time to time. Some of the uh, teaching, uh, some of the subjects are taught in English. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Uh, now we can hear you. There was a period when we could. I think probably we should give the floor to the next speaker while Svetlana Vladimirovna is taking care of her technological problems. The next speaker is Yan Lei, Yan Lei, and he is going to speak about Russian jokes, uh, Russian anecdotes, and how the Chinese students uh, uh, perceive them. We can see you, we can hear you, you are welcome. Darya Igorevna will now share her screen with us to show the presentation. Darya Igorevna will now share her screen with us to show the presentation. By Lei Yang. Uh, my name is Yang Lei. I'm a postgraduate student at Moscow Pedagogical, Moscow State Pedagogical University. And I would like to tell you about how Chinese students perceive the uh, uh, ethnic and cultural characteristics of the people, of the people in Russia uh, through the Russian anecdotes. And I would like to say that uh, this is something which is not easy for the Chinese students when they communicate with uh, Russian language native speakers. Uh, 
Анекдот – это разновидность юмора, обладающая всеми характеристиками юмора. Uh, это форма... Uh, the, uh, uh, well, national anecdotes, jokes, have all the characteristics of humor, and what is very important, humor is national in character. And it reflects the national perceptions. The task of my uh, research is to present uh, to uh, my Russian colleagues some of the problems that uh, the Chinese uh, students encounter when they listen to these Russian jokes, uh, Russian anecdotes, uh, when communicating with Russian students. And uh, I would like to analyze the specific features of uh, national uh, humor as reflected in, in the anecdotes. Uh, the goal is to identify the national and cultural specific features of this humor by analyzing uh, Russian anecdotes and uh, to uh, uh, consider the notion of humor and the specific features of how it is used to analyze uh, the perception of the Chinese students of um, these uh, national cultural uh, specific features of Russian anecdotes and to analyze the main ways uh, of, um, well, telling these jokes. And uh, I would like to cite some examples. In Russia, humor is how you depict different aspects of life uh, and there is usually uh, some mocking element uh, it depicts in uh, an artistic format uh, what uh, reality uh, is uh, it gives a comic funny uh, description and uh, the interpretation, um, the comic interpretation is combined with uh, internal, uh, internally serious, earnest approach and compassion uh, for uh, somebody that uh, people are laughing at. In China, humor is an artistic uh, quality of a different kind. And that's why it is not easy uh, for the Chinese students to understand Russian anecdotes. Russian anecdotes always have uh, evident uh, modern and social characteristics. Uh, uh, Russian anecdotes very often uh, use uh, um, the uh, use politics as something that people are invited to laugh at. And uh, very often uh, they have anecdotes about uh, the ethnic, uh, the ethnicity of a person, uh, like the Chukcha anecdotes. Uh, the understanding and reading of Russian anecdotes by modern Chinese students not only helps to perceive the unique um, sense of humor of the Russian people, but also helps them to understand the Russian people and the Russian national character and national identity better. Uh, Russian anecdotes uh, very often uh, speak about the specific characteristics of a person. Uh, and usually it's, uh, well, either uh, the cunning, a, a cunning person, a sly person, and 
I'm sorry, the sound is not uh, quite good. I can't hear him now. A technical problem has emerged and we cannot hear our presenter. Can anyone hear him? No. Uh, well, no. Number five. I think he asked for a different slide. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Something's wrong with the connection. We can't hear you. We can't hear you now. Now we can. Uh, sorry. Russian any dots are uh, a, a kind of art in itself. And uh, they use different methods, phonetic ones, lexical and stylistic ones. Well, let us take the first example. Uh, uh, there are uh, some jokes connected with uh, the ethnicities, different ethnicities of the people. For example, a Georgian is selling a car. Is the car uh, new? Uh, and uh, the uh, Georgian man answers, yes, uh, it's new. And uh, he used adjectives in the uh, wrong um, uh, in the singular, uh, or as if he were speaking about, uh, um, uh, well, as if the, uh, the words don't quite agree with uh, one another in uh, plural and singular, uh, the, the pronunciation is wrong. Uh, Uh, and then uh, the, to the question, and is the car new? Uh, yes, it is. Why are you selling it? I want a new one. Again, this juxtaposition of the same word uh, when it does not seem to be logical creates the humorous effect. Uh, uh, and uh, in the next example, uh, a play on words is used uh, when they speak about a happy marriage and uh, a piece of sloppy workmanship in Russian, the same word brak can be used. Uh, so the conclusion I can uh, make is that an anecdote is a kind of humor which has all the characteristic of humor and it is an inalienable part of national culture. It has profound national and cultural roots and uh, uh, usually, a combination of kinetics, lexics, and uh, stylistics and other language elements is used. And the true understanding of Russian anecdotes uh, requires that students have an in-depth um, um, insight into the social and national uh, conditions of life in Russia and the culture of Russia. And this is very important in order to uh, inculcate in the Chinese students uh, the feeling of humor, which will enable them to understand Russian jokes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there questions to our uh, presenter? So far, there are no questions. I would like to thank you for your uh, research and ask you a question. Uh, do you believe that it's possible to teach someone or to learn uh, to understand the humor 
of a people who are quite different. Uh, so as the person would find it not difficult to understand any doubts in this language. I think that humor is a combination of features Uh, it's uh, for a person who is beginning to uh, read such jokes or listen to them, it's very difficult. Sorry, I only hear some words which don't produce a sentence. Sorry, the problem um, with uh, the sound. Uh, and we are returning to Svetlana Visharenka. I shall do my best uh, to show my main slide to you. I think there is some problem with connection today. And I'm afraid, I'm simply afraid to stop. Uh, and I'm afraid to spoil everything. Uh, today's in, uh, educational environment cannot exist without cooperation between different educational establishments. And every year, uh, the same uh, university will uh, have students who belong to different cultures. And at present, the number of uh, syllabi uh, is uh, quite great, is very high, and it is, uh, the number is increasing. And some of them, uh, some of the subjects are taught in English. And of course, in this case, the students are not native speakers, either in Russian or in English. Uh, of course, we have very many Chinese students. And what we see is that, among other things, there is a conflict between the paradigms, uh, educational paradigms, We see um, a conflict between a, a personal, a person-centered and authoritarian paradigms, and also approaches to the teaching process are different. Uh, grammar and translation, as Yelena uh, Vladimirovna said, and communicative methods. Uh, in our uh, curriculum, we uh, may have not very many students uh, while in China, uh, the classes are usually quite large. And of course, uh, individualization of approach to every student, uh, the uh, possibility for the uh, teacher to um, use individual approaches in China would be quite limited. Of course, uh, the English language has, uh, uh, is uh, grammatical. Uh, in China, the language is syllabic. And other speakers, uh, uh, Hao Lan uh, and Yelena Timatieva, uh, say that the uh, those who are uh, native speakers of uh, syllabic languages have a shorter expiration period. They also have a problem in uh, the uh, with the stress and intonation, uh, both in English and in Russian. And as for my main slide, uh, I would like to stress that um, for a period of about two years, I was doing my best to uh, identify the main problems 
that uh, the Chinese speakers uh, encounter in English, uh, as we all know, there is a contrast uh, between uh, the vowels that are pronounced uh, when uh, the vocal cords are tense and are not tense. Uh, and uh, well, 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 the Russian language in this respect is closer to the Chinese language. So our students and the Chinese students are more or less in the same uh, boat. Uh, the Chinese students have problems with the right expiration because they are breathing differently. Uh, uh, Nina Gardieva is uh, from uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, described the uh, uh, described the breath and expiration of the Chinese uh, as having a shorter period than that of Russian speakers. Uh, difficulties emerge with the stress and the intonation because in the Chinese language, uh, a certain intonation, according to the Chinese students, uh, they have uh, a special meaning. In Russian, our intonation uh, is quite different from theirs. And a number of students are afraid that they would be misunderstood by their teachers as a result of uh, this difference in intonation. And of course, with what uh, uh, the eye catches is uh, the difficulties in differentiating uh, the uh, voiced and non-voiced uh, um, uh, consonant sounds. Uh, and of course, there are differences with uh, differ the differentiation of sonorous uh, l and r sounds. Uh, also, uh, voiced and non-voiced uh, consonant sounds. There are problems with the uh, reduced uh, non-stressed vowels and I think that uh, Russian students, Russian speakers also uh, share this um, problem with the Chinese students, uh, reduction of non-stressed uh, vowels, uh, while in the Germanic languages, it is different um, from the Russian language. And also, uh, the uh, uh, the pa sounds are made, which are non not characteristic of the Germanic languages, because in Chinese you simply can't you can't uh, use several consonants uh, in Russian. Uh, they also exist, but they are somewhat different. And uh, Yelena <clears throat> Timofeeva has suggested a system of exercises in this system for every uh, phon uh, phoneme. Uh, they uh, created an aesthetic image. And this is a wonderful system. And uh, I was very interested in acquainting myself with it, and I liked it very much. And Mikhail, Malo Mar Mikhail Marozov also suggested uh, some proverbs and uh, language uh, phonetic drills, uh, some exercises to develop the right expiration. But in modern conditions, we had to work uh, online. Uh, and this work, uh, work uh, to improve the phonetic skills proved to be very difficult. You only have two or three minutes left. And any such work requires that the teacher should be in the same room with the student. 
while with online classes, we have to rely on different uh, uh, media which uh, reproduce the sound and they somewhat distort the sound. And besides, uh, foreign students uh, 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 Russian speakers and Chinese speakers are under uh, psychological uh, and emotional stress. And this uh, shows that they are speaking at a very high uh, pitch and they are breathing very um, hard, uh, which actually strains our vocal cords which is bad for them. What else can we say? Uh, we should be working on a new system of exercises, uh, taking into account the experience we have already amassed, and also taking into, ac into account the fact that in the modern world, we very often rely on microphones and ear earphones, and earphones also create a certain background noise, which, uh, well, uh, which impairs very gradually uh, the hearing of people. And if used too often, uh, that can result in permanent uh, damage. And I hope that in the modern conditions, we'll be able to work a new adapted system of exercises. Thank you for your patience. Uh, sorry about the problems, the technical problems that I've had. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Svetlana Vladimirovna. Are there any questions to our presenter? If there are no questions, uh, I'd like to ask mine. If I get it right, uh, the phonetics uh, um, education the, for Chinese, for learning Chinese, has not um, resulted, hasn't resulted in a particular reference book. I think that the reference books that exist today can be updated and must be updated due to the changing situation. So that, if to say it in brief. So now we come to our next presenter. So she will be the last one, but not the least important uh, one. That is Natalia Evgenievna Medvedeva. She will uh, present her article on home reading in the context of intercultural dialogue. That is our favorite aspect at our universities. Thank you, dear colleagues. I'm so glad to see so many uh, people whom I already know for the organizing, uh, thanks to the organizing committee for um, organizing everything in such hard times. So I will um, go on to the crux of my article. I just need, uh, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure what to press. Could you help me, Daria Igorevna? Uh, my dear, could you help me? Yes, so you need to press the F5 button. Well, nothing has happened. So then you should press the um, slideshow button, which is at the top of the screen in the middle of, uh, of the buttons. One minute, please. I will do that. Yes, so, okay. Uh, well, it seems it doesn't function, doesn't function properly. So we haven't pressed the slideshow button. Okay, so you should press it. Okay, I get it now. Thank you. Well, it, it seems that it doesn't function as again. You could uh, go down. 
Well, it seems that I have some technical pro issues today. May I please leave it as it is? Uh, thank God I have a uh, second version of the presentation. Please, could I leave it as it is, uh, since with my manipulations it might be worse? Okay, then I will unpress this button. Okay, please give me one minute. Please do not... Uh, do not don't be concerned about that. Yes, it seems that everything is disappearing on my screen. Well, please give me one minute to solve all the technical issues. If you don't mind, I will leave it as it is so that uh, it doesn't get worse. Okay, so do you see my presentation now? Yes, I do. Okay, that's great. Uh, now I will start my presentation. Uh, so working with Chinese students uh, enabled me to understand uh, that although they come from a different culture, the understanding of education and their motivation is very close to Russian students. And the obstacles uh, are mainly related to the educational paradigm, uh, since it is well known to the, since the Soviet times. Um, they have cultural and national um, features and uh, particularly Chinese students are aimed at writing, whereas some um, oral exercises like expressing your view is uh, quite challenging to them. So if you even ask simple questions like, did you enjoy your visit or not, is uh, not that easy for them to answer. This is why the Chinese students do not expect any play, uh, playful activities, uh, any um, specific exercises that involve uh, oral expression. And I have started um, working with a group of Chinese students. They were the second grade students, and I tried to know more about their hobbies and their interests. And after that, I learned that uh, they were actually um, learning by heart some, some uh, scenes or pieces of literature and uh, home reading with further discussion became an essential component of uh, English language um, learning. I know that uh, they were interested in that and that uh, this uh, practice is uh, uh, common in China. Of course, we didn't practice it on a regular basis, but still this was a, a approach and now I will dwell on the particular methods that um, involved uh, communication um, skill, uh, skills and uh, were aimed at increasing their, exp uh, their um, speaking competences. Well, <laughs> you see, I, I'm still having some technical issues. I think that it's not necessary, it's not pertinent uh, to talk about the role of the literature right now. Of course, we can uh, see a range of uh, linguistic and uh, regional studies material. And I, I did have a slide with that information, but unfortunately it has disappeared. The educational uh, and uh, aesthetic value of uh, this activity cannot be overestimated. What texts uh, can be chosen for home reading at English language lessons? There is a problem arising. Of course, it's quite evident that uh, today very few students uh, read and sometimes they do not do that. Uh, 
systematically, uh, they, they read something sporadically. And I had to take that into account while planning my classes. I started the home reading uh, classes with discussing the national culture. The reason for that is that uh, the the chosen text must correlate with the preferences and cultural background of students. Secondly, this piece of literature must encourage students to participate in discussion. And when students find something that is relevant to their own everyday experience, they become increasingly interested in that. That's why I um, suggested that they should uh, choose uh, a text and discuss it afterwards. When we discussed the chosen book, I suggested having a look at a video with a Chinese orator at YouTube. Um, if uh, this slide can be shown, oh no, it cannot. I, just, I don't understand what's going on, but still I will go on. There is a video on YouTube and a Chinese speaker shares her experience of reading in pairs. So two people are reading a text at the same time and afterwards discuss it. The discussion of the video enabled us to understand the specific features of home reading. We see that uh, there are many factors that affect the interest of students in this uh, activity. I uh, came up with a special reference book on home reading, and there were many recommendations on uh, literary terms, uh, literature terms that must be mm, that must be focused on. Uh, I talked, well, I incorporated such terms like the plot of the of text and then the characters of the text. I also suggested watching a small cartoon, which is called Wings. It is a very nice uh, cartoon and uh, I made sure that uh, the students uh, got ready for home reading by watching this video and uh, by distincting the plot and the characters of the cartoon. The home reading was based on the classical uh, Chinese uh, literature. There are different views on what can be included in the home reading curriculum. Uh, there are some pre-reading questions and post-reading questions. What stages can we uh, highlight? The first stage is discussing the biography of the authors. Of course, as I have already mentioned, there are different approaches to that. And uh, in the majority of cases, students had to prepare a presentation on the biography of a writer and uh, they made use of all the devices at their disposal. They could, uh, for instance, organize an interview with the writer. Uh, since they know their national uh, writers, they were quite uh, interested in the discussion and they also made uh, some riddles. The knowledge of uh, cultural artifacts like um, texts involves also the expression of personal opinion. There are many other stages, but I want to highlight the third one. The writing skills are very important and uh, the students were, su were supposed to write their review of a book. This way, they mastered the competence to express their opinion. They were to write an essay on their favorite character or write an annotation of a, of a book. Sometimes they had to compare characters that were opposing each other. 
or write a recommendation, a, a review of the book for a friend. When we talk about home reading of world literature, the, well, the method remained the same, but the pre-reading and post-reading questions were quite different. They were to concentrate on vocabulary. I asked them to find uh, some adjectives that uh, were very frequent in the text. They um, had to incorporate this voc vocabulary, these new uh, words that are new to them, I mean, in their description of, char of characters. Home reading has aimed at uh, broadening passive and active vocabulary of students. And this also involves creativity. Some exercises that I have mentioned before were also incorporated in this home reading curriculum. The students were also to prepare some artistic projects in the form of presentation, or sometimes they could um, do the following. They were to write a daily journal as if they were a character from this book. That is an alternative. Um, well, I would say that is an alternative way to finish the discussion on a book. One of the um, options suggested to the students was to write an annotation on a book or they could come up with a design for a, uh, for the book cover. So this is what I wanted to say today. I think I should finish right now. I think that home reading of native, uh, of national literature uh, artifacts is very important since it broadens their outlook and they are able to understand the place of their national uh, literature in the context of the global literature. This is also essential uh, for the intercultural and cross-cultural dialogue. I really appreciated the work with my Chinese students. They were enthusiastic, they were engaged in the work. And uh, the fact that I got so much positive uh, feedback actually um, was a source of inspiration to myself. I'm really sorry that I could not demonstrate my slides today. Um, well, but I think, I hope that you have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you, Natalia Evgenyevna, for your uh, really enriching uh, statement. Um, there are no questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for for the understanding, I will. Yes, we do understand everything. Sometimes uh, some things are beyond uh, our um, abilities uh, and beyond our control. Um, dear guests, dear participants, uh, Natalia Evgenyevna, uh, please, uh, could you stop the uh, demonstration? Oh, you see, now it works. Oh, the moment I finish, it starts to work. Yes, I have turned it off. Uh, dear colleagues, dear guests, I think that's the conclusion of our section. We have uh, heard a number of um, presentations on various topics. Unfortunately, we do not have space and time for a proper discussion, but uh, still we uh, complied uh, with the um, recommendation of uh, our rector who recommended us to uh, change, interchange our findings and our professional experience. Uh, we thank you for your participation and we will look forward to uh, meeting you uh, next year. I want to remind you that uh, afterwards you will see the plenary session um, 
video on YouTube and you will see our plenary session participants. Thanks once again for participating in the work of the section today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will see you at the plenary session.